Hello there, this is Stereo Police and welcome back to lecture 2.5. It's not quite 3 yet because this is related to lecture 2. This is a segue from batteries into how this relates to high-end audio. So I always want to kind of relate from here on out a previous lecture into something that relates to uh, audio equipment. All right, and giving you a little clue here, um, the previous lecture relates to audio equipment in many ways, but I chose to exemplify it in relation to power supplies and capacitors. So we're going to delve mostly into capacitors today. And I think, I really believe this is going to be extraordinarily interesting. I challenge you to, to stay with it the entire time. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. The terminology that I'm going to talk and uh, I'm going to, that I'm going to discuss today, you hear quite often in high-end audio. And you're going to understand how it works. And also, we're going to go down to my workbench, which I have not visited for years. And we're going to do a little demo, a real-life demonstration. Okay, what are we looking at here? I think everyone kind of knows what it is. Um, it's the an audio amplifier with the top cover removed. And virtually, uh, well, every audio component, virtually every audio component, unless it's a completely passive component, has a power supply of some kind, whether it's a battery or whether you plug it into the wall. Um, but it's got a power supply. It's got to be powered by something. It needs a source of energy. And of note, many audiophiles are especially concerned with the power supplies of power amplifiers because they need to generally supply the largest amount of energy and the largest amount of current that goes directly to your loudspeakers. And many people consider the power supply actually to be the most important or one of the most important parts of a power amplifier. Now we're going to re we're going to revisit this image right here. And by the way, these banks right here are capacitors. And they are, in essence, the batteries of your power supply. They have other functions, too. Um, they, they're also filters. They filter out noise. And they maintain a stability of voltage. But they're energy storage devices. And they're kind of equivalent to a battery, but not exactly. And you've heard the term capacitors, and you've probably in reviews, you've um, reviewers have talked about um, the capacitance of the capacitors of the power supply in farads or microfarads. If you're into car audio, capacitors are a big deal. I mean, these little guys are a big, big deal in audio. And they're all over the place. These are big ones, but right down here, we got some little ones. There's some right here. They're kind of hard to see in this, in this image. It gets a little blurry. They're right here. You can spot them everywhere. There's some right there. They're all over the place. And again, they're, uh, not only are they, and I'm, I'm digressing here, and, and you don't need to, we don't need to know this now, but because we're, we're going to just talk about what these things are and what they do today in terms of energy storage. But they're also used 
And we're going to talk about DC, direct current, today. We're not going to talk about AC. But in the AC world, these little capacitors can be used uh, in filter circuits. They're also used in your crossover networks of loudspeakers to filter out certain frequencies. And on a schematic diagram, the symbol for a capacitor looks like this. Sometimes it, oops, a daisy. Sometimes it might look like, like that. Sometimes you're going to see a little positive symbol because they're polarized, just like a battery is polarized in a magnet. Well, some of them are polarized, some of them are not. And the ones that are polarized have a positive and negative leads. Okay, that's probably way too much information right now. Let's just focus on what these things are and what they do. And we're going to focus on DC, not AC. And we're, going to, and we're going to talk about that more in subsequent lectures. So don't worry. Let's not get mired in the details. So we're going to return to this image, but let's talk about what a capacitor is. And again, I'll say every single image, and if I, if I encircle something, in a box that means I've cut and pasted it from a source and the source is always listed I'm hoping I'm complying with fair use for educational purposes and I encourage you to visit these sources because I've attempted to pull this information from excellent sources that if you're interested in this and you want to dig deeper please by all means visit these sources I've attempted to vet them, and, and, and I've considered them good sources of information. All right. A capacitor is a device that stores energy. And this is why uh, all of my lectures build on the previous lectures. So I'm not going to return and talk about what energy is or electric fields or electric charge. You should already know that. So they store energy. They store potential energy and convert it into kinetic energy. Now a capacitor cannot, they store a much smaller amount of energy than, 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 a, <clears throat> than a battery. However, they're still extraordinarily useful uh, in circuits. And, you know, just like I showed you in that schematic diagram, they come in many forms that, you know, you've seen them, they look like this. And um, many, you know, lots of different forms. Scroll down here and um, there's, a, I have one, you know, the power supply capacitors some, sometimes look like this. And they have what are called plates. And I might get redundant, I might return to this. These plates are separated by a distance. And between the plates, there's an insulator. So the plates cannot touch each other. Do you remember the very first lecture when I created the capacitor and the insulator was uh, parchment paper and the plates were made out of scotch tape? And the scotch tape, each side stored an electric field. Um, if you remember before I put the scotch tape on the parchment paper, they attracted each other because one piece of tape was charged positively and the other piece of tape was charged negatively. And then what you do is you get them real close to each other but separated by an insulator. And if you remember, opposite charges attract.
And I'm going to give you an analogy in a minute, but let's just talk about how that works inside of a real-life capacitor. So how that works, practically speaking, is you, if you were to pull open a capacitor, you would see the plates right here uh, depicted in gray. One of them would be the positive, or in this case, it's the negative side and the positive side. Don't, they're never going to touch each other but they are going to be connected to the leads. And then you're going to see the insulator right here that's often re it's referred to as the dielectric. It's an insulator. And there's another insulator out here so that uh, this plate doesn't touch uh, the case. All right. So and you can see why the symbol for a capacitor looks as it does, because the symbol kind of represents what a capacitor is. Two plates separated by distance. <clears throat> now inside, uh, let me scroll down here, yeah, inside of a capacitor, now here's our plates. Once it's charged, and we're going to talk about charging a capacitor in a minute. Once it's charged, you've got a whole bunch more of electrons or charge carriers on the positive plate. Uh, pr uh, forgive me, I said that wrong. A whole bunch more of electrons or charge carriers on the negative plate. And you have an absence or, or we, we could call them holes on the positive plate. And remember, they're separated by distance, and there's a dielectric or an insulator here. And remember, opposite charges attract. So here's my goofy analogy. You know, it's like having two nightclubs. You know, and there's a bunch of people over here. I'm going to say, I used to say guys, but I'm just going to say people. And a bunch of other people over here. Different nightclubs. They have different doors. And there's a window between them. And they all come up to the window. And these people are actually attracted to each other. But because of that window, and they want to meet, but because of that window, they can't touch each other, talk to each other. They want to, but they can't. The only way they can is if they exit through the door and go out to the other nightclub, which could happen in a circuit. I made that up. That's my analogy. I don't, I've never heard that before. All right. <clears throat> now, let us talk about how we charge and discharge a capacitor. But I am going to take a brief break here. Okay, let's discuss how we charge and discharge a capacitor. Remember, a capacitor, among other things, is an energy storage device. Now, we can charge a capacitor in many ways, and in this example, we're going to use a battery another energy storage device. And remember, a battery is also a pump. We talked about that. It'll pump electrons. So we're going to use this battery pump to charge our capacitor. And we're going to attach the negative terminal of the battery to one plate via a wire. And we're going to attach the positive terminal to another plate via a wire. And when that happens, electrons, remember it's 
and little E negative, are going to start to flow. because of the pressure caused by the battery. And they're going to start to flow. And remember, the battery's pumping now. Starting to, starting to pump those guys. Now, the battery is pumping electrons in one direction, but just like a pump, it needs a source. And that source is this plate. So electrons are exiting I can't draw. Electrons are exiting this plate. They're leaving. They're leaving this nightclub <clears throat> and they're going to this nightclub. So they're starting to accumulate over here. Now, let me see if I can erase a few things here and I want to make a really important point, a point that's really fun to me. And it's not necessary for you to understand, but I think it's really cool. Actually, it is. Let me draw a switch. <clears throat> now, hang on a second. Okay. Initially, when these two plates, before the switch is closed, are equally charged, you know, there's an equal number of electrons on either plate. And so when this switch is first closed, and all these electrons start rushing out of this one and into this one, this battery is a big dummy. He doesn't know he doesn't know what's out here. He just sees a rush of electrons. So I'm going to draw a battery. I drew it wrong. Negative positive. And what he sees out here initially is a short circuit. A short circuit. No load. It's just a rush of electrons. This is really interesting. Just keep that in mind. Now, after a certain point of time, this capacitor becomes fully charged. It can no longer supply any more electrons. It's, and on this plate, the electrons become fully accumulated. It has a capacity. It's full. And the charging is complete. And again, this battery is a big dummy. He doesn't know anything. All he knows is, well, let me just draw the battery again. It's our symbol for a battery. So what he sees now, okay, remember, this is fully charged. So no more, it can't supply any more electrons. So the current comes to a standstill. And, if, the, and if, if there's no more supply of electrons, the pump stops pumping. So what the battery sees out here is an open circuit. He doesn't know what's out there. It's an open circuit. It's like it's not even connected to anything because the capacitor is fully charged. Now, now that the capacitor is fully charged, we can just disconnect the battery and put the capacitor in our hand and it's, it'll retain that charge. Not, well, for a certain period of time. There is a little bit of discharging that will go on in here. The dielectric is not perfect. And not only that, remember there's water vapor in the air and it could literally discharge through the air as well. 
you know, that's one of the reasons that um, static electricity is so bad in the winter, but not so bad in the summer, is because that static electricity can discharge through the humidity of the air. But not in the winter, there's no humidity. So let's take that, you know, okay, we disconnected the battery. We're going we're gonna to carry our capacitor over. And let's say we have a switch here. And it's open. And we're going to hook that charged, fully charged capacitor up to a lamp. In this case, this is depicting an LED. And there really ought to be a resistor in line here. But that's not a topic for today. Now, capacitor's charged. Let's close the switch. Now, remember, a charged capacitor is an energy source. It's a source of potential energy. And now we're going to convert it to kinetic energy. And this LED is a load. And it will dissipate the kinetic energy in the, for, in the form of light and heat. And there is some internal um, resistance that will dissipate in heat and some other things. But mostly light. This is lambda. It's a symbol for light. All right, let me... Let me erase this stuff right here. All right, let's close the switch. Now we have a circuit. What's going to happen? Well, electrons from this potential energy source are going to start to flow. And they want to flow from negative and this is electron flow, by the way, not um, conventional flow. We're back to electron flow. From negative to positive. And it's going to go through the load. Right on back to the positive side. So this, in effect, becomes a battery. In effect. In a sense, it's not a pump like a battery, but it's an energy storage device. And unlike, it's not really storing it in the form of chemical energy, but it's, it's an energy storage device. Let's leave it at that. And you can see how it's stored energy. So the electrons are going to continue to flow. The load is going to convert that energy to light. And that flow is going to continue until we reach an equilibrium state on the plates where both of these are charged exactly the same. And then the lamp will stop glowing, and we're done. And that's how a capacitor works. And that's what a capacitor does. Now, a capacitor has other characteristics when we talk about AC voltage. But that's a topic for what we're going to get into later. Um, this is, and, and by the way, capacitors, <clears throat> capacitance, the units of capacitance is farads. Um, most often, did I draw that wrong? Uh, anyway, most often the units are microfarads because a farad is a colossal unit of, 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 of charge. So most often, we're going to see it in units of microfarads. Point. Let's see. What's a microfarad? It's been a long time for me. Point zero, 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 one farad. Correct me if I'm wrong, somebody. I, I've been in the intellectual property world for uh, 30 years, and uh, I've been out of the loop. But anyway... 
Now, uh, this slide, why do they have this? Um, let's see. So, capacitors' primary functions are to filter out AC noise. We're going to get to that later. Suppress rapid changes in voltage. Okay. Right here. They're used as bulk energy storage. And this is, this is why they're so important to power supplies of audio equipment. It's the noise filtration, yes, and the bulk pr providing instantaneous current to the load. And that's what we need when we're driving 4 and 8 ohm, etc., loudspeakers. You know, when we talk about 4 ohms and 8 ohms, and that, those are very, very demanding loads requiring high amperages, relatively speaking. This is a very large capacitor. Not large physically, but um, high energy storage. Uh, I can't even read that number. I don't, I don't have my close-up glasses on. Now let's return to the power amp. I like looking at power amps. So back to our capacitor bank. Now you know what you're looking at. One for each channel, left and right channels. This is, to me, clearly a two-channel power amp. And remember, and I'm, uh, I'm on a, a tangent here, but these are the heat sinks for each channel. That, and, of course, heat sinks, you, you'll see here, these are likely the output transistors attached to the heat sinks. And this big thing here is the uh, step-down transformer, just the transformer. So all of this stuff right here is likely the power supply. The power supply of the uh, power amplifier. And we're almost done, but I, I want to talk about power supplies. Now the next couple of slides you could probably skip if you wanted to. It's going to get a little bit technical and a little bit more advanced, so we're going to talk about this stuff later. Some of you might understand it, but, I'm, but it's worthwhile because I'm going to inter introduce you to some tech, uh, terminology that you often hear about um, in the audio world. And I'm going to talk about what power supplies do and, and in relation to these capacitors. <clears throat> this is a typical schematic of a linear power supply having trouble with my headset here, forgive me. And what will happen is, let's consider this to be wall voltage. And here's your little plug that you plug into the wall. And your wall voltage is AC or alternating current, and we're going to talk about that later. But your amplifier operates the circuitry likes, prefers DC. So AC is alternating current. It's also alternating voltage. So your transformer, that big circular thing that you saw there, first of all we need to do is step down from the high voltage, in this case probably 120 if you're in the U.S. Step it down to something lower. Let's. I'm going to pick a reasonable number here, like 50. And what this is, is your rectifier. Okay, so what we have here is just, you know, a lower version. Okay, we had a big AC voltage here, and we stepped it down. That's what the transformer does. <clears throat> the rectifier turns this AC voltage into DC voltage. So there's nothing below zero volts. This is zero volts. See up here, here's your zero volt line. So you had positive going and negative going voltages. So it turns it into this little lumpy DC voltage. That's what a rectifier does. But we don't want this lumpy DC voltage here, that's a lot of noise. What we'd like to have is a nice flat 
DC voltage. <clears throat> and this is where <clears throat> our capacitor comes into play. So what our capacitor does is this lumpy this lumpy DC voltage through a succession of being stored and released gets filtered by the capacitor to something more akin to a flat line and that's what you're seeing here. It's not exactly perfect uh, and what you're left with is something called ripple. But it should be very, very, very small and negligible and not to affect uh, the sound, the audio signal. And there's other ways of dealing with it as well. And really good, well-designed power supplies will almost all but eradicate the ripple. And not only that, this capacitor is storing a whole, it's not only filtering, but it's storing a whole bunch of energy. So that when there's a transient in the sound and the circuitry requires a burst of energy, it can all be released by the capacitor quickly, far quicker than a battery can. Because a battery requires these internal chemical reactions that require time, whereas a capacitor can do it very, very almost instantaneously because it's all the charge is built up and ready to roll. I've provided you with this link here if you, uh, if you want more information on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice video, how to convert AC to DC. You can see there are lots of similarities here transformer, rectifier, filter storage. This right here is a voltage regulator. Some uh, power supplies use them, some don't because um, I don't like them because they slow down the flow of current when it's needed. Uh, they might be useful for preamps, but in large audio, uh, high power audio amplifiers, uh, they're questionable to me. All right. So in summary, almost done. These are energy storage devices and filtration devices. They can store and release energy rapidly. And we are finished. Let's go look at a demo. I'm going to take you down to my workbench and also introduce you to a really, 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 really old friend. One thing that I want to go over with you right prior to us going down to the workbench is I want to explain to you what, what we're going to be doing so you know what you're looking at ahead of time so I don't have to fumble around telling you down there. So we're going to take out a capacitor and I have and I, I wish I had a large one but I don't uh, uh, in my collection. I have little ones like this. Um, I wish I had a big one like this but I don't high capacity one like that but I don't I don't mean to use the word large small because that's relative to size so I should say a high capacity one um, but I don't so I'm going to take a capacitor and the one I have is polarized so it requires that we hook positive and negative voltage particularly to the proper terminals or leads and the first thing I'm going to do is um, just measure it. So this capacitor, a capacitor 
is specked out into two values. It's specked out into its uh, into the voltage that it can handle, and it's specked out into the uh, microfarads. That that's actually its capacitance. Sorry for my drawing, uh, my um, my writing here. That that's its uh, energy storage capacity. And I forget the capacitor that I have down there, but let's just say I have um, um, a 10. <clears throat> I do believe I have a 10 um, microfarad um, capacitor. <clears throat> I may be drawing micro. Is it micro is like that, or is it like that? Forgive me. I forget. It's been a long time, folks. Um, anyway. Say it's a 10 microfarad capacitor, and it's and the 60 volt. Now, 60 volt has nothing to do with it. So it's um, it's not like a battery produces 60 volts. That means you never want to put more than 60 volts across it. Otherwise, it'll break down, and electrons might start actually flowing through the dielectric, and it's going to destroy the capacitor. Capacitor is going to blow up in your face. Maybe. You see, it's a safety margin. All right. Now, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to hook up the leads to a capacitance meter just to verify what the capacitance actually is. It's never on spot. You know, it's always a little different. There's a tolerance. And most elect all electrical components have a tolerance, you know, a plus or minus, you know, 10 microfarads plus or minus, let's say, uh, three microfarads. You know, it's in the ballpark. So I'm just going to find out what it is. And also just to make sure that this is a good capacitor because the one I'm using has been sitting in my drawer for years and years and years. So let's do that first. Okay. Then, here's the experiment. Let me start over again. Then we're going to charge the capacitor. And I'm going to draw a battery symbol out here. Let me draw a switch. We're going to charge the capacitor. Now, I also want to measure the voltage across the capacitor, so I'm going to have a digital voltmeter out here, but I'm going to draw it as an analog meter right here, okay? When we first close the switch, and what I have is I have a little dial right here. Normally, I'd have a, re a resistor in here to, s to make sure it charges nice and slow. But I'm going to use this little dial and slowly rotate it, and I'm going to charge this capacitor up to about 20, 20 volts. And then this meter over here is going to read 20 volts. That means there's going to be 20 volts on this capacitor. We're going to be looking at this meter right here. And then I'm going to open. Now that means, remember, this capacitor is charged, just like we talked about. It's, uh, it's a source of potential energy. Um, just like we talked about above. We won't get into that again. Then,
I'm going to open the switch effectively and we're going to watch this voltmeter and initially it's going to read somewhere around 20 volts and let me just draw a little diagram and this is time right here and this is voltage right here initially it's going to read about 20 volts and you're going to see it go down and down and down to zero volts so what happened what's happening here is that it's held its initial charge initially and when I open the switch it's beginning the electrons are beginning to flow into the voltmeter and the voltmeter itself is acting as a load of sorts that's discharging the capacitor slowly over time uh, to a point where there's no more charge left and we'll watch it go down to zero or close to zero now keeping in mind the voltmeter is not the only thing discharging the capacitor there's a little bit of loss inside the capacitor itself and there's also possibly a little bit of loss in the air in the humidity anyway there are some other ways capacitors can discharge and the capacitor I'm using is very very small it doesn't hold on to a lot of charge it's a small I don't have a large capacitor here but if I had one of those humongous capacitors that 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 uh, car enthusiasts use in their cars like one farad capacitors it would hold on to that charge like this and just I mean for a long 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 time because it stored a lot of charge so that's what we're gonna watch and I don't have that kind of time anyway so I'm glad I have a small capacitor so we can watch it discharge but the point being is when I open the switch you're gonna see that it's charged it's, you know it's a source of potential energy and then it's imparting it's it's imparting it's a uh, converting that potential energy to kinetic energy by virtue of being discharged into a load all right let's have fun all right we are in my old workshop on the workbench I haven't been down here in quite some time uh, you may be sort of kind of, kind of hearing this out of one channel because I'm positioned on, on the left side of the camcorder and what you see here are three different styles and different sizes of capacitors this one has uh, leads that come out of each end of it and these styles have leads that come out of the same side uh, one style is called the axial leads and the other styles are called radial and as you can see these particular these are called electrolytic capacitors and these are polarized and in polarized capacitors the positive and the negative side is indicated clearly and you can see the capacitors marked with its capacitance in this case 2200 microfarads and this has a voltage of capacity of 16 volts you wouldn't want to exceed that you wouldn't want to apply more than 16 volts I'm sorry if it's not focusing I can't see across it I just found this one I think I'll... oh so this particular capacitor is uh, a very old one um, and I want to make sure that it still works <clears throat> and you can see that if it's focusing there's a little positive symbol there it's a positive lead and it's eight microfarads at 450 volts 
That means you wouldn't want to exceed 450 volts. That doesn't mean it simply sits there and produces this. It's not a battery. And then 8 microfarads is its capacitance. So let's go ahead and test it. I have a capacitance meter right here, and I'm going to set the range. Given that it's 8 microfarads, I'll set the range to up to 20 microfarads. And I'll clip the negative lead and the positive. Let it settle, and it's settled down to about 9.7 microfarads. And you can see there's a tolerance there. It's supposed to be <clears throat> roughly 8, but it's 9.7, 9.8-ish. Not exactly, but close. All right. So I want to save this one. I think I want to use this one in the experiment. This is a much larger capacitor. This is 2,200 microfarads. I just found this one. We'll set this aside. And let's switch over to the experiment that I discussed a few minutes ago. And let's use this capacitor right here and see how it stores charge and releases charge. All right, what you're looking at here, this is a source of DC voltage. And you're going to see the DC voltage indicated here. Positive will be running out to the positive lead of the capacitor. Negative will be leading, uh, running out here to the negative lead of the capacitor. These two will be going to the digital voltmeter that we're going to be looking at in a second to indicate <clears throat> what the voltage is on the capacitor. Because once it's charged, I'm going to be um, breaking the lead here, releasing it. So you can see that as I rotate this knob, we're beginning to charge. You know, right now I've got, for example, 8.4 volts. And that 8.4 volts will be appearing it's across the capacitor. That capacitor is now charged to 8.4 volts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back down to zero, let that capacitor discharge, and I'm going to rotate around and have you look at the digital voltmeter. And that's my old friend right there. That's my first ever digital voltmeter. Purchased from Radio Shack back in the early 80s I was a um, I I was a teenager when I purchased that I still have it and it still works it's a little bit beat up but it still works it's still it's not the most accurate thing in the world but it, it has sentimental value I still use it for experiments like this okay so I'm going to start rotating that knob I just showed you and you're going to watch the capacitor charge and I'm going to charge it to a roughly 20 volts. I'm going to let it settle. And what I'm going to do, just to show you, I'm on a tripod here, is I'm simply going to remove that lead right there break the connection between the voltmeter and the capacitor and that capacitor will, will be on its own and the voltage you see will be the voltage on the capacitor and then you're going to see the capacitor has stored the voltage and then you're going to see the capacitor start to discharge just like I showed you if I had two cameras down here I'd kind of show it to you side by side but I'm going to tell you are you ready I'm going to try to make a noise. You can hear it. Okay, I'm ready to go. Done. Capacitor's all by itself now. And it's discharging. It's releasing that charge. Um, it's become a little battery of sorts. Not, it's not a battery, but it's 
it is discharging those electrons are flowing now from the negative plate to the positive plate this voltmeter is acting as a load all right what you're looking at here this is a source of DC voltage and you're going to see the DC voltage indicated here positive will be running out to the positive lead of the capacitor negative will be leading uh, running out here to the negative lead of the capacitor these two will be going to the digital voltmeter that we're going to be looking at in a second to indicate <clears throat> what the voltage is on the capacitor because once it's charged I'm going to be um, breaking the lead here releasing it so you can see that as I rotate this knob we're beginning to charge you know right now I've got for example 8.4 volts and that 8.4 volts will be appearing it's across the capacitor that capacitor is now charged to 8.4 volts so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back down to zero let that capacitor discharge and I'm going to rotate around and have you look at the digital voltmeter and that's my old friend right there that's my first ever digital voltmeter purchased from Radio Shack back in the early 80s I was a um, I, I was a teenager when I purchased that. I still have it and it still works. It's a little bit beat up, but it still works. It's still, it's not the most accurate thing in the world, but it, it has sentimental value. And I still use it for experiments like this. Okay, so I'm going to start rotating that knob I just showed you and you're going to watch the capacitor charge. And I'm going to charge it to a roughly 20 volts. I'm going to let it settle and what I'm going to do just to show you on a tripod here is I'm simply going to remove that lead right there break the connection between the voltmeter and the capacitor and that capacitor will, will be on its own and the voltage you see will be the voltage on the capacitor and then you're going to see the capacitor has stored the voltage and then you're going to see the capacitor start to discharge just like I showed you if I had two cameras down here I'd kind of show it to you side by side but I'm going to tell you are you ready I'm going to try to make a noise you can hear it okay I'm ready to go done capacitor is all by itself now and it's discharging it's releasing that charge um, it's become a little battery of sorts not it's not a battery but it's it is discharging those electrons are flowing now from the negative plate to the positive plate this voltmeter is acting as a load Now in a minute, I'm going to substitute a much higher capacity capacitor. This is a 10 microfarad. We're going to put a 2,200 microfarad capacitor in there. And we're going to see the difference in the discharge rate. Because that 2,200 microfarad capacitor, this one here, will store a lot more charge. getting slower isn't it see as we discharge it starts out really kind of fast like a steep ski slope and as we get towards the bottom the discharge rate gets slower and slower and slower it will eventually reach close to zero so we could sit here for quite a while and watch this but I think you get the idea 
So let's go ahead, and I want to. I don't want to do any cuts because I want to show you that I disconnected the power supply. So let's go ahead and change. I'm going to reduce the voltage to zero and change out the capacitor. Let me see if I'm. Let me see if I'm. Let me zoom out a little bit. Let's change out the capacitor to a larger capacitor. When I say large, I don't mean physically large. I mean a higher capacity to store charge. Again, this is a 10 microfarad. <clears throat> We're going to put in a 20, a 2,000. This is not going to focus on it, is it? <clears throat> 2,200 microfarad. So um, 220 times more of the capacity. Did I get that right? 2,200 divided by 10. Okay. So let's go ahead and first hook up. This is going to be tricky because these, these leads are so tiny. Okay, the negative. I need to do. That's our that's our voltage source. Now this capa capacitor only has a voltage rating of 16 volts, so we're only going to charge it to 10 volts. I don't want to exceed 16. Okay, we're going to hook up the voltmeter now. That's what these are. And normally I would have a resistor in line to make sure that the charge rate is nice and slow. I don't want to overwhelm it with a big inrush of current, but I'm going to go very slow here as I... as I charge that capacitor to 10 volts. Okay. Okay, now I'm ready to charge. What I, I had to do a cut because what I didn't realize is the negative lead was 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 off, so I had to put the negative lead on. Okay, now power supply, DC voltage, connected. These are the leads that go to the voltmeter. So let's begin to charge the capacitor. Nice and slow. And again, I'm going to charge it to 10 volts. I don't want to exceed its 16 volt rating. If you're lucky, this will be a bad capacitor and it'll explode and you'll get to see a capacitor explosion. These electrolytic capacitors can be dangerous. Okay, we're charged to roughly 10 volts. Now what I'm about to do is disconnect, doesn't matter, negative or positive, disconnect the power supply, um, open the circuit. And so first let's go look at the voltmeter. And let's bring that up to 10. Okay, now I'm about to open the circuit from the power supply. You ready? Open.
And what you should have noticed is the, especially initially, that initial slope of discharge was slower than the previous capacitor. Now these two capacitors really aren't that much difference in their ability to store. Um, I wish I had one of the really, really big ones, like the one farads to show you the, the, the vast uh, difference. But you can still see there's a difference in discharge rate. And you can see that we are disconnected from the power supply. This is the disconnection point right here. Now let's do one more one more um, experiment. Let's see how long this capacitor can hold on to its charge without it being connected to the voltmeter. Okay, so it's now connected to only to the power supply, and let me bring it up to about 10 or 11 volts. And we need a second to charge or some internal resistance in the wires, that sort of thing. So, uh, all right. I'm going to completely disconnect this. And let's just let it sit there a second. And I'm going to connect the negative lead of the voltmeter. And I'm going to show you the digital readout of the voltmeter. Doing nothing now because it's it's an open circuit. It's beeping because it wants to, it needs to be fed. Now I'm about to. It's been sitting here. What about 20, 30 seconds? I'm about to hook it up to the voltmeter. Let's see if there's any voltage left on it. Here we go. Done. See, there's still seven volts. So it was doing a little discharge on its own. Um, internally and through other factors. And that's one of the reasons in audio equipment, when you turn a component off, it's not, and even after you, if you turn it off and unplug it, it's not necessarily really off. You've got capacitors in there that are holding on the charge and they're in process of discharging. And when you have really large capacitors, much, much larger than that one, much higher capacity, it could take a lot of time for those things to discharge, and you don't want to open up something and go probing around. You could get one heck of a shock. In the case of tube amplifiers, those shocks can be deadly. And a good technician has capacitor discharge probe. I have a video about that way back, about how to make one. And you'd want to be sure to discharge those capacitors. And you see, um, and solid state equipment not so critical because they operate on lower voltages like 30 40 50 60 volts tube equipment we're talking about three four five six hundred eight hundred up to a thousand volts big difference all right i hope you found that interesting this is stereo police back in my old workshop and revisiting a really old friend. Hey, I'm uh, almost 60 years old and I've known this guy <laughs> hang on 
I've known this guy right here since I was a, uh, a teenager. An old friend. Look at that guy, still discharging, huh? Stereo Police, I hope you enjoyed this. Ciao.